Mini PCs are pretty awesome. You practically have the same functionality as a full-size desktop, but in something that can fit pretty much anywhere. Sure, a full-size desktop is definitely the way to go if you're looking for the best man for buck, but for a lot of people, a mini PC can be just what they need. And out of all the mini PCs available, I think that Mini's Forum EM780 is one of the coolest options. Measuring a more than adequate 4 inches in length and 1.5 inches tall, some might argue that's almost too big, but I would argue that for a PC that's extremely compact. Luckily, what this little guy lacks in overall size, it makes up for in power. On Amazon, it currently retails for $639.99 USD and comes with Windows 11 out of the box. For the APU, it's using the Ryzen 7 7840U with 8 Zen 4 cores running at 3.3 GHz with a boost up to 5.1 and Radeon 780M RDNA 3 graphics set at 28 watts, 32GB of LPDDR5, 6400MHz RAM, a Kingston 1TB 2230 NVMe SSD, Wi-Fi 6E, and Bluetooth 5.3. For I.O., it has two USB 4 ports, three USB-A 3.2 Gen 2 ports, one SD card slot, one audio jack, and one HDMI 2.1 port. Thanks to the USB 4 ports, it has eGPU support. And if you were to pair one off with this little guy, you would have a full-on gaming PC. I've been using a prototype with a Ryzen 6600M in it from SGW Zone that UPS kind of destroyed during shipping, but luckily I managed to glue it back together and get it working. The performance I'm seeing out of these two is kind of crazy. I'm talking 60 FPS, medium to high settings, a 1080p, and even 1440p in modern games. That's with FSR, of course. But anyway, I won't get too much into that today since we're talking about how good or how bad the EM780 is on its own. And speaking of that, let's look at some benchmarks. Oh, and if you're not too crazy about numbers, feel free to skip ahead. I made sure to include timestamps, but you'd be missing out on some good stuff. Also, if you appreciate that and you like what you're seeing or hearing, I too procrastinate with YouTube playing in the background, don't forget to like and subscribe. Anyway, on to the benchmarks. For this section, I use 3 Mark, Geekbench 6, I don't know why I have such a hard time with those words together, and Cinebench 2024. First up, Night Raid, it gets a score of 25,990. For Time Spy, it scores 2,999. Fire Strike, 6,639. And on the Speedway Stress Test, its best loop score was 444. Worst loop, 440, with a 99.1% frame rate stability. For Geekbench 6, it gets a single core score of 2,026 and a multi core of 9,908. And finally, for Cinebench 2024, it gets a single core score of 81 points and a multi core of 760. That's a lot of numbers, and I know for a lot of people, they won't mean much on their own, so in order to get a better idea of what those scores tell us, let's see how they compare to some other devices using the 7840U. I picked a few popular devices with similar specs. However, for the laptop, I went with the Acer Swift Edge 16, which unfortunately only has 16 gigs of RAM. But since the Edge 16 kept popping up when I was searching for popular laptops using the same chip, I decided to include it. Other than that, I picked the Ionia 2S, the Win 4 2024, Win Max 2 2024, and the ROG Ally. I know technically the Ally is using a different chip, but the Z1 Extreme is just a 7840U minus the AI unit and with some lower TDP optimizations, which for our tests don't really matter because we're going to be using this plugged in anyway. Numbers wise, both GPD handhelds come out on top, but all six devices score within range of each other, so the real world performance should be very similar. One thing to consider is that other than the ROG Ally, all these devices retail for almost twice as much as the EM780. Now, you could argue that they do offer a full on-the-go experience that adds value, and I would agree with that. But it's still very impressive that something this size can keep up, and I'm not trying to say this is a better option. It's simply to give you a better idea of what this little guy can do. If you decide to grab one of these, in the box you're going to get a 65 watt GAN charger, a USB-C cable, HDMI cable, and a USB-C docking station in case you want to use a physical connection instead of Wi-Fi. Unfortunately, it's not face amount compatible, but that's not a huge deal since it's so small you can easily tuck it away somewhere. While it's disconnected, let's do a quick size comparison. First up, an Xbox controller, my mouse, two PAPK TV 90s, a Mia Mini, a Steam Deck, and my regular PC. As you can see, this really is tiny, and it's amazing how much can be packed into such a small package. And don't ever forget that, fellas. Speaking of how small it is, I think it's time we take a look inside and see how Mini's form is keeping this tiny thing so cool, and what upgrade options we have. The top cover can be popped off, and once it's open, we get greeted by a decently sized fan. To access it, we need to lift the black sticker so we can remove three screws keeping it in. Once it's out, 
We can see the motherboard and some of the other components, but I won't be going any further on this side since Mini's form is using liquid metal to help keep the API cool. I don't really want to mess anything up by an accident. Moving on to the bottom, we need to remove the four rubber feet so we can access the screws to take the bottom cover off. Once we remove them, we can just take a pry tool to pop the cover off, but don't rip it off because there's a power cord down here for the bottom fan. Once it's off, we can see the small fan and the heat sink to help keep the SSD cool. And that's about it. We really don't have many upgrade options other than the storage, but since this comes with one terabyte and it has an SD card slot, I don't think it's going to be too necessary. Now, the final thing I want to see is how loud the fan is. So I'm going to be recording it idle, under light load, and when pushing it all the way. So generally, if you're just going to have this on your desk next to you, it's really not going to be anything that's going to bother you or that you're really going to notice unless you're really, really pushing it. But even then, the sound isn't really that bad. As far as plugging it in and using it, you have two options. Either using a USB-C connection for both video and power if your monitor supports it, or just using an HDMI cable with the included charger. On a side note, I actually ran this off a power bank for a little while and streamed it to my Steam Deck, and that was pretty cool. I'm not sure how useful it is, but it does open it up for some cool uses. Okay, so booting into Windows, we have a pretty clean install, or as clean as Windows can get. You're going to also have to spend some time updating, but that's just part of the Windows charm. Getting into the actual user experience, the everyday stuff like watching 4K videos, writing documents, backing up games, opening all the Excel sheets you could ever want, all that's going to work just fine. I didn't really have any issues with any of that. I also tried some photo editing and it should be able to handle any general photo editing needs the average user might have, maybe even a little bit more than that. Personally, my Photoshop needs are more on the basic side, but you shouldn't have any major issues with it. You can also do some video editing. I played around with DaVinci Resolve and I was surprised how well it handled it. Using 4K videos, I set my timeline resolution to 1080p, added some text effects and messed around with some color grading. Mostly, it was a smooth experience and I was able to scrape my timeline without any major hiccups until I tried using some more demanding effects. Those can really tank performance. Once I was done, I was able to render an 8 minute 1080p video in a little over 6 minutes. Personally, I think that's pretty good for something that does not have a dedicated GPU. Alright, well let's get to the good part now and let's talk about some gaming. First up, let's talk about emulation. I'm going to skip all of the easier to run systems and just kick it off with GameCube and Wii. For those two, you're going to be able to run most games at a 4 to 6x resolution, 6x being 4K. And I've mostly kept it at 4x since I have a 1440p monitor that really wasn't any point in going any higher, but you should be able to push a lot of games up to 4K without any major issues. Now, this isn't to say it's always going to be smooth since you still have to deal with shader caching, but once that happens, things tend to even out. PlayStation 2 is a similar story. Every game I tried ran at a 4x resolution without any major issues, but compatibility could be a problem with some of the more obscure titles, so always keep that in mind. However, I can confidently say the majority of PlayStation 2 games will work, and most of them can be pushed up to 4K if you want to play them on the big screen TV. I didn't do a lot of testing for the original Xbox since this emulator is still a work in progress, but the games I did try ran at a 2x resolution with only some minor issues. It feels like this emulator gets a lot less attention than others and it's probably because Microsoft has done a decent job of keeping the more popular titles available. But there's still a lot of games locked away on the original Xbox, so I would suggest taking a look at the compatibility list for Zemu because if it's on that list, this PC has more than enough power to play it. I have a lot of great memories with the PlayStation 3. Can you believe it came out 18 years ago? This emulator can take a little bit of work to get going, but once you adjust some settings, the EM780 can play a lot of the PlayStation 3 library as long as the game is compatible with the emulator. If you're okay running games at 720p, you can of course squeeze out better performance, but I wanted to run these games on a bigger monitor or a TV, so I set the resolution to 1080p. To my surprise, Every game I tried played at that resolution, and I was even able to get God of War 3 playing at a steady 30 FPS. If you're familiar with emulation, you know this is a tough game to get running. Yeah. 
just like with PS3, you're going to have to spend a little bit of time setting up Xenia. To get these games working, you're going to want to use Xenia Canary build and edit a text document, but it's really not that bad and it's well worth it. Unfortunately, Xenia doesn't have any upskill options, but it's a great way to replay some classic 360 games that aren't available anymore, and a lot of 360 games still hold up. You will have to deal with some graphical issues here and there, but nothing I would consider a deal breaker. Wii U tends to perform better than the last two emulators, and it's no different here. Sure, most of the best Wii U games have been ported to the Switch, but there's still some great games trapped on the Wii U. Games like Twilight Princess and Wind Waker HD still haven't been ported, and in my opinion, the best way to enjoy Breath of the Wild is to emulate the Wii U version. However, I did notice some graphical issues using Vulkan, but most of them went away when I switched over to OpenGL. After that, I was running Breath of the Wild at 1080p with a consistent 45 FPS after shaders cached. The final system on the list is Switch. Using Ryujinx, I set everything to 1080p and I tested both Mario Odyssey and Red Dead Redemption. For Mario, I was able to run around the desert with a consistent 60 FPS. This world can be very demanding, so it's nice to see a steady frame rate. For Red Dead, I was also able to get a pretty steady FPS. I just kept it at 30, but I'm sure with mods you could get this up to 60, and I didn't notice any graphical issues. Why'd they leave? As great as emulation is, this little guy can handle modern PC games, so let's take a look at that. For indie games, you're going to be able to push the resolution up to 4K and have a great time. Here I have Death Store running at 4K, max settings between 60 and 70 FPS. But of course, if you have a high refresh rate monitor and you want that smoother experience, you can just drop that down and get well above 100. This is going to be the case for most indie games, so if you're looking for a solid indie machine, this is going to be able to do it, but this can also do a whole lot more than that. Moving on to something a little more demanding, we have Borderlands Game of the Year Enhanced Edition running at 1440p, medium settings, and staying between 60 and 70 FPS. So just like with the indie games, older PC games can run at a high resolution and still keep a decent frame rate. So if you have a big backlog, this might be a good way to tackle it on a big TV. But what about some more modern games? Cyberpunk 1080p medium settings FSR balanced and it gets between 30 to 40 FPS outdoors and low to mid 50s indoors, depending on how hectic things get. I could have just ran an in-game benchmark, but I wanted to play the game for a little bit more of a hands-on experience, and all things considered, I could see myself playing this game like this. Next up, The Last of Us, 1080p, low settings, FSR quality, it averages low to mid 30s with some occasional drops to the high 20s in big open areas, and high to low 40s indoors. Locking this game to 30 FPS on this chip seems to be the way to go, and while it's not the best visual experience, it's still amazing to see it run on something this tiny. Finally, we have Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart running at 1080p, medium settings, FSR balanced, and similar to the last game, it gets low to mid 30s in big open areas, high to low 40s indoors. Of course, running these higher end games from a PC this small is going to come with some compromises, but for the most part, the games are very playable and the temperatures never got above the mid 70s. Nefarious. These rifts are getting out of hand. Nefarious is in way over his head!
I love mini PCs. Sure, you don't get the same power and upgradability as a full-size desktop, but with how good mobile APUs are getting, mini PCs are starting to become a legitimate option for many users. One of the big benefits of a mini PC is how compact they are, and the Mini's Forum EM780 is probably the best combination of size and power you can find. Would I recommend this to somebody specifically looking for a gaming PC? No, because you can build a more powerful system for about the same price. But for someone looking for something small and compact that they can easily put in a bag or a small work area, this is one of the best options. The specific use cases for a mini PC like this vary. It could be a dedicated Steam machine with something like Chimera OS, a remote access system in the small work area, or something you'd take on the go with a power bank and some AR glasses. You never know what specific needs somebody might have, but it's good to know that if you pick something like this up, you can have a mostly uncompromised experience. Personally, I'm going to be setting this up in my living room TV to stream and play some games on. Well, that's going to wrap it up. If you want to pick one of these up, check the links in the description. It adds no extra cost to you and it helps support the channel. Thanks for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it and that it was helpful. If I missed something or you have anything you want to share, please leave a comment. I would love to read your opinion. You can also find me on the Retro Handhelds Discord and every Monday on the Retro Handhelds Podcast. See you next time.